Hello and welcome once again to the Waters and Stanton video channel. Bit of a mixed bag today actually. Looking on the screen here, I've just got details from ICOM of a brand new VHF UHF transceiver, dual band transceiver. Uh, it's known as the ID50. Now unfortunately there's very little details available, in fact there's no details available apart from the fact it's dual band and of course it uh, covers D-Star and has I know, all sorts of features. I'll put up on the screen here the uh, picture that I've got of the ID50 and you may be able to glean something from the picture but uh, it doesn't uh, tell me much. Interestingly enough it's got Hearn Bay on the uh, screen there. Now whether or not ICOM UK have got a sample um, I don't know. Um, from the very brief details they've sent me, it doesn't suggest they have got a sample, so maybe it's a bit of a Photoshop, I don't know, or perhaps they've got ICOM in Japan to put that up there, possibly. I think it's likely that ICOM Japan decided to put uh, Herm Bay on there. Anyway, as far as I know, it's going to be available in the summer, um, so it's all very vague, but anyway, I thought I'd let you know that there is a new transceiver coming along from ICOM, ID50, available sometime in the summer, no idea of the price, no idea of the specification. Sorry. Now I was prompted to give a bit of a plug for CW activity because I recently got a newsletter from Keith, the uh, G3WGE, who's the chairman of the Essex CW Radio Club. Now although Essex would suggest it's a local club, I know that it has members all over the world, all over the country and all over the world. And um, it's worth taking a look uh, at their website, the Essex CW Radio Club. And as I say, G3WGE uh, Keith is the chairman of the club. Interesting enough, they have a, um, a Morse uh, evening on two metres, would you believe? For those who want to practice CW, um, it's on 144 decimal, what is it? 144 decimal 06, 144060 on two metres. Uh, at uh, on Sundays at uh, eight o'clock or twenty hundred hours, so one four four zero six zero on Sunday uh, at twenty hundred hours. Keep a listen out, particularly if you're in Essex. I'm not sure what the range is. I'm not sure whether it's omnidirectional, but anyway, if you're within hearing range of that, it might be worth uh, having a listen and uh, just sort of seeing. Uh, what goes on there. And if you're interested in, uh, in building up your CW speed, obviously it will help. Um, they're also active um, on, uh, I think, National Field Day. They're um, uh, active with the Braintree um, Ham Radio Club. Uh, they've got a boot camp coming up and so forth. So it's a very active group. And um, I thought actually I would mention a bit about CW because um, it's one of these Marmite things, hence the picture at the front of this video, Marmite. CW is a bit of a Marmite activity. It's you either like it or you hate it. But sometimes, you know, people, you know, there are people who've never tasted Marmite. There's, not, there's a lot of amateurs that have never really tried CW. Now, CW basically is the origin of radio communication. It was the first way that it was possible to communicate just by switching the transmitter on and off. And of course, it developed a code so that uh, certain uh, combinations of dashes and dots, in other words, switching the transmitter on and off quickly or slowly, would, um, uh, in, would actually represent a letter. And you could build up a word. And of course, today, CW operators um, are very uh, skillful. Some of them are very skillful, very high speed. But it is quite fascinating. I think there's two, there's two reasons it's fascinating. Firstly, it's a bit of a challenge. It's a bit of a challenge and it's historic. It's nice to do things which may not be the fastest in the world, but to some extent, it's one of the best ways of communication. If you think about it, if we have a 100 watt HF transceiver, when you're sending CW, you're actually generating a signal that is 100 watts. 
Now, compare that with SSB. The information in an SSB signal generally is in the average zone, the average power zone. The peaks really don't carry too much information. The main information is in the average power. And the average power of a CW, of a SSB transmitter uh, that's rated at 100 watts is 50 watts, maybe a bit less actually. So you're only getting a sort of 40 or 50 watts signal out which carries the relevant information. CW would seem to have a 3 dB advantage. And the other advantage is that on CW, all you've got to do is just to be able to detect the signal. In SSB, if that signal was at that same sort of level, you wouldn't be able to really understand what the guy was saying. But with CW, provided you can actually detect the signal, you can copy it. So one of the, uh, one of the big advantages of CW, of course, is it's very good. Uh, weak signal form of communication. Now I know we've got FT8 and all the other digital modes and that's fine but there is some something of a fascination in operating CW and also it's a skill. I think it's a skill to be proud of. If you if you can master it then it's very satisfying. It's rather like, I don't know, it's like playing the piano or whatever. Um, it's very satisfying. It's, it's not easy to start with. You think, gosh, am I ever going to learn this? But the secret of CW really is rhythm. It's, it's rhythm. Um, you've got to get, you've got to learn the code first of all. You've got to learn the letters. There's only 26 letters in an alphabet after all. You've got to learn, learn it. And then once you've learned it, you, you've got to try and recognize the rhythm. It's no good counting the dots and dashes. That, that doesn't work really. You've got to recognize the rhythm. And that's the bit that takes a bit of time. But once you've recognized the rhythm, you're away and you can build up the speed. So that's my push on CW. Now whilst we're talking about ham radio history, 450 ohm ladder line, 600 ohm open wire feeder, 300 ohm ribbon. These are the ways that fed antennas years ago, before coax cable existed. I think coax cable came into into common use uh, around about the Second World War. But before that, it was balanced line, open wire feeder. And the, the closest to open wire feeder really is 450 ohm ladder line, which is uh, very readily available. It's also very light, it's amazingly light, but it seems to be pretty strong because I've had ladder line up, this sort of 450 ohm ladder line up for quite a few years and had no problems at all with it. I came across uh, an interesting article in QST, uh, April 2006, I think it is, um, by N1II. And he did an interesting test. He erected a 100 foot doublet, and I think he was using a 100 foot of balanced line as well. He was using open wire feeder, but really, really and truly, the difference between open wire feeder and 450 ohm uh, slotted line is, is neither here nor there. And I put up on the screen now the measurements that he uh, achieved using a 100 foot doublet with uh, open wire feeder. And as you can see, the loss is minuscule. It even operates on 160 meters. I mean, a, a, a 160 meter half wave is what? 264 feet. Sorry, it's Imperial. A half wave on uh, 160 meters is 264 feet. This doublet was 100 foot long and he lost 7 dB, which is significant, of course. But then when you come to 80 metres, where the antenna is roughly a 3 8 wave, 100 foot on 80 metres, the loss was less than 1 dB, about 0.7 of a dB. That was the loss with the VSWR and the feeder. And as you can see on all the other bands, the loss was less than 1 dB. So you can see the advantage of balanced line, particularly 450 ohm or open wire feeder. It gives you a very flexible antenna and it's also got very, very low loss. Another interesting paper I came across on the internet um, by G4NNJ talking about balanced line. And he made the interesting observation that perhaps balanced line is not as sensitive to its placement, its positioning, as we may have thought. And I, I would agree with that, with my experience, that um, 
we're told, aren't we, to keep balance line away from metalwork and so forth. And you know, as if the 5 RV makes sure it goes down in a straight line. Well, I'm not sure that's actually true. I've had balance line near a metal mast, um, probably six inches away, and I've not really noticed any particular problem. And I think possibly that the warning about how you use balance line and how you keep it away from this and that may be overcautious. It may be one of these things that have been passed down over the years um, and we all believe it. But my experience and certainly uh, the paper by G4NNJ suggests that balance line is not as sensitive as you might think or perhaps have been told. In fact, he even suggests that uh, he had some balance line on the floor, coiled up, and it still seemed to work. Although he then said, I wouldn't recommend it. So I think that if you're thinking of using 450 ohm ladder line and you're worried about its placement, don't worry that much. You may find that it's not affected. So it's a bit of trial and error really, but I've certainly used it in places where I would have thought it shouldn't be used and I've had no problem at all. There we are. Okay, so that's a um, video about some news items, about some history. <laughs> I'm well placed to talk about history because I've been around for a long time. Anyway, thank you for your support on this channel. I must much appreciate it. And, and uh, don't forget to press the subscribe button. And as usual, um, I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye for now. Thank you.